Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today as we explore the essentials of psychoeducational assessment for non-school psychologists. Um, as Sherry said, my name is Lindsay Simmis. I am a regional manager on the healthcare team here at Pearson. I'm also dually licensed as both a school psychologist and a clinical psychologist. I've worked in universities, private practices, and I've also worked in schools, um, primarily therapeutic day schools, where all of the children had IEPs and came in with um, private evaluations from a variety of disciplines, so clinical psych, speech, OT, PT, and it was always a pleasure working with um, clinicians who could offer a different perspective. I'd also like to introduce Dr. Patrick Moran. Hi, I'm Patrick, and I am also a, a clin clinical psychologist and a school psychologist, licensed in um, Oregon and Washington. And uh, so, part of part of our background, my background, also uh, has been to clearly be working in the school systems as well as with kind of the educational service districts that support them, and have also done a number of consulting and contributions to various state departments of education on. Uh, their um, special education regulations and policies and so on. So I'm glad to be here today. Oh, by the way, I just want to add one thing is that this is scheduled for 60 minutes, but we may have some flexibility if we want to go over um, for questions and answers if people have time and want to stick around. And with that, I'll hand back off to Lindsay. <laughs> Thank you. So our webinar today was really designed for psychologists who work in private practice or maybe group practices, clinics, hospitals, who conduct clinical and psychoeducational evaluations for children and for adolescents. So we'll focus on some of the important aspects of these evaluations. Yeah, and a lot of these, uh, the idea for this came out of conversations that we've had with a number of uh, clinicians who were doing educational assessments, um, but were not really familiar with some of the expectations and demands of the school system. So I wanted to add that piece. Right. And as some clinicians are beginning to maybe do evaluations as schools have been shut down in COVID, it's become an um, increasingly popular topic. So on the agenda today, um, Dr. Moran and I are going to review some of the key concepts and terminology that is used in schools. So this background knowledge and introduction, very brief introduction to education law will hopefully help the kids that you work with get the services that they need. So I'm going to review some key concepts and terminology as well as state and federal regulations for psychoeducational evaluations. And then Dr. Moran is going to review some different aspects of funding, payment, models of eligibility for learning disabilities, and review some test considerations. So to kick us off, I'm going to review some frequently used terminology that you might come across um, with psychoeducational evaluations. So we've got our um, independent education evaluations, IDEA, Section 504, Individualized Education Programs, or IEP, um, Educational Eligibility versus a DSM-5 Diagnosis, and then Accommodations and Modifications. So first up here, what is an IEE? Since we're talking about psychoeducational evaluations um, with children, you most likely ended up here as an attendee today because maybe you work with children or you're beginning to work with children. Um, and of course, given this age range, the school is likely somehow involved with your evaluations. Perhaps the, um, a parent may have requested a private evaluation from you because they suspect, suspect something isn't right. Uh, maybe the child is already receiving special education services, but the parent or guardian isn't satisfied with the evaluation. Um, or maybe the school has hired you to conduct an independent education evaluation. Um, as you may know, if parents do suspect that their child may have a learning disability, they can request that their public school complete an evaluation at any time. So all the parent has to do is just um, submit the request in writing to the school principal or else the director of special education. Um, the federal law that gives parents this right to request an, request an evaluation anytime is called the Individuals with Disability Education Act. So by law, local districts must identify 
locate and evaluate every child who may have a disability requiring special education services. And this is called child find. So if there's a suspicion that a child has a disability, that school, they have, that school has that responsibility to complete a full individual, comprehensive and multidisciplinary evaluation. So IDEA sets a 60 day time frame for this evaluation to be completed. Something that's kind of interesting is that schools can actually choose their own time frame and how to interpret that. So some states, I'm located in Chicago and in Illinois, we have 60 school days to complete um, an evaluation, whereas some states might use calendar days instead of school days. So if the parent requests a school-based evaluation, um, the school can either agree or disagree to complete this evaluation, and we'll get into that um, in a few minutes. Um, of course, parents always have the right to request a private evaluation. So of course, that's something that would be completed by you, maybe an, an outside um, psychologist, and the parents end up paying for that evaluation, maybe out of pocket or with insurance. And then if the parents decide to share your evaluation with the school, then those results become part of that um, kid's educational record. And the school must consider the results of your evaluation. But the catch is that the school doesn't have to fully accept those results, um, in which case a parent may request an IEE or an independent education evaluation. This IEE is at the public expense. It's a little bit different than your typical private evaluation where the parent is paying. With an IEE, you still have to have a qualified professional, but the school's paying instead of the parent. And the person who completes the evaluation can't work for the school district. They're usually picked from an approval list of professionals. Um, you can't be connected with the district. Uh, the person has to be competent in psychoeducational evaluations. And you know, if you're not doing this now, this is something that you could potentially explore to expand your practice. Um, all states have different methods of identifying approved psychologists to complete IEEs within the school, but essentially, this is a list that the school would then provide to the parents who can make a selection about the provider who's going to complete this independent education evaluation. Can I add a few things? When you're done? Of course. Yeah. Uh, so so uh, the, the first issue is uh, around child find. And um, so this is uh, this law is really fairly expansive in requiring schools um, or um, what we call uh LEAs, local educational authorities, to find kids that need basically educational services um, who aren't getting them because of some of their, maybe their impairments. Now, this is not just limited to learning disabilities specifically. It could be because of behavioral, um, emotional disturbance, or whatnot. But one of the things that's important to appreciate about this child find law is that um, you know many districts will, uh, it, Basically, the responsibility, if you are living within a district's uh, um, boundaries, is that that district has to take the responsibility for testing the children. But with child find, uh, if you're homeless or you're, you're in a situation where your family may be couch surfing or you have a... Uh, Maybe you have a, a homeless youth or independent youth who's not living with the parents for whatever reason, is that those boundary requirements go away. So that literally a student who might be a county over may uh, um, is now eligible to become a part of the neighbor, uh, neighboring school district, whereas uh, uh, somebody else who's not maybe captured under the child fine law uh, would be within the parameters of that LEA, that local educational authority. So it's kind of an important piece there. But the other thing is often with IEEs um, that Lindsay was talking about is there have been times when districts may overlook uh, or they maybe have not done the job uh, of capturing um, a student's uh, educational needs and then doing the testing. And then later on, something happens. And so they want to be able to be uh, protected by engaging with uh, independent evaluators to help make those decisions as well. So there's a real opportunity for psychologists to be able to work with districts who who want to kind of build in that extra parameter of protection uh, in the in the evaluation process. Thanks, Lindsay. Yeah, that's a, it's a really good point, and it's a great segue to our next slide. Um, so what if parents don't agree with the evaluation? So 
on the slide, you'll see what rights do parents have if the school district refuses to complete an evaluation or after the evaluation is completed, the IEP team determines that the child is not eligible for special education. So I'm gonna run through what could happen in that scenario. That might be something that you've encountered as parents have come to you as um, a private practitioner. So there's several courses of action mm -hmm. that can take. Um, the easiest outcome would simply be that the parent says I dis that I, I disagree with the results. I'd like an um, IEE, and the school simply agrees to pay for this. Now that would be the, the easiest path forward for the family. But in some cases, the school might push back, um, as as Dr. Moran was saying. Some of those common disputes are that maybe they disagree with the evaluation itself, they disagree with the eligibility, how the child was found to be eligible, they disagree with the child's placement, um, they disagree with the tools that were used to assess the child in the school, maybe they wanna see some changes to the IEP program, or it could be there's a situation where the child has been suspended or expelled, in which case that would result in a manifestation determination, which um, Dr. Moran's gonna to touch on in a little bit here. but. Essentially, as part of this dispute resolution process, the parent could either start um, with mediation, they could file a state complaint, or they could file for due process. So with mediation, this just allows the, 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 the district has to have a plan set in place for conducting mediation. And this allows the parents in the school to both explain their position to someone who is unbiased and then helps both parties agree on a legally binding solution. The cost of this mediation is paid for that by that state education agency. Um, one step further would be to actually go through due process. So with due process, the parents pay for the attorney and then a hearing officer makes the final determination on whether that, you know, the, the family would get that IEE. Um, essentially the school must show that the evaluation that it completed was right for that child if the school can't prove that, then the hearing officer would decide that the school has to then pay for an IEE. Now, if the parents still disagree, then they go much further down that road and, and may proceed with a civil suit. So can I add something to this? So the um, the, the well-managed um, um, special ed uh, team at the outset of any of the, of the special education processes is that the parents um, agree, have to agree to kind of initiating it. But um, what they often may not understand, I think it's important that this gets explained to them very clearly, is that once they sign for the initiation of an IEP testing process, is that final decisions are no longer just theirs. It's a team decision, which means that they basically the decision can go against what the parents want once they have signed that uh, that uh, documentation. Now they have recourse as uh, uh, Dr. Seamus has uh, explained, but that's a really important caveat. I think that uh, ethically we wanna make sure that our, our uh, folks that we're evaluating are fully informed about that legal process when the IEP begins. Thanks. Right, right. Yeah, I, that's a, it's a really important point to make that it, it is a team decision and you know, it's also important to remind a parent that they're an important member of the IEP team and they have a say. So what exactly is um, IDEA, this Individual with Disabilities Education Act? I know it's probably a term people are familiar with. Um, this is a federal law that makes free appropriate public education or FAPE available to eligible children with disabilities and ensure special education and related services to those children. So there's over 2.5 million infants, toddlers, and children in the U.S. that receive early intervention, special ed, or related services. So a really important function of IDEA is to authorize grants that support these children with disabilities. These grants actually come from the Office of Special Education Programs. So each state every year gets grants that support early intervention, so that's infants and toddlers, birth to two, preschool, which is ages three to five, and then special education, which is for children and adolescents up to age 21. So if you conduct an IEE, the results of your report would have to be considered to make sure the school is providing the child with FAPE. 
Now for the IEP, this is, it's, it's more than just a written legal document. It's truly intended to be a roadmap that's gonna lay out special education programming, supports and services that kids need to make progress and thrive in school. It really begins with that evaluation, which was likely school-based, and then potentially the an outside evaluation, private or IEE, can help assist with determining whether that kid will get an IEP. But it's important to note your report does not automatically qualify a child for special education. The real key is that you need to demonstrate educational need for that child for special to receive special education services. And then um, that team, that IEP team would help make that decision. So one, one other thing I'd like to add is that IEPs are part of public education. So they're given to kids who attend public schools and charter schools. Private schools don't necessarily offer an IEP, but they may be able to receive services through what's known as an individual services plan. Hey, uh, Lindsay, there's a question yeah. I think it's worth responding to real quick. Um, sure. So the question is, did you say that a school district does not believe and evaluate, if they don't think it's warranted, that parents may ask for an IEE at district expense, question mark? Uh, wouldn't the school then decide to go ahead and evaluate? Do you want to weigh in on that a little bit? from your experience? Um, uh, um, oh, I'm trying to look at the question <laughs> just to make sure I'm fully answering it. So the yes, number nine. think that there should be an evaluation. The parent can request an IEE at district expense. Yes, they can. The school may, well, okay, so, and then it says, would the school then decide to go ahead and evaluate? If the school doesn't think an evaluation is warranted, uh, they may not go ahead and evaluate, in which case the parents right. would ask that IEE. Right. I think that, um, you know, if they're dissatisfied with it, they, they can appeal to a, a, a kind of a higher authority to try to get that going. But, um, uh, you know, that does get involved with maybe, you know, I'm not sure if it's maybe pre-due process, but schools don't like to get involved with due process. So sometimes it's, it's worth their while just to go ahead and do the evaluation. But Yeah, and then yeah. if they do the evaluation and the parent is still dissatisfied, they can ask the, I mean, they can ask the school to pay for an IEE anytime they want to, mm -hmm. but the school might say no. And then the course mm -hmm. of action, if the school says no, is that mediation, due process, and all of that. And I could say, and I can say that, yeah, schools... <laughs> do prefer mm -hmm. the process. Yeah. yeah. So here is a list of educational eligibility. Um, the, there's versus DSM-5. So these 13 areas that you see are how a student can qualify for services under IDEA. So IDEA requires public schools to provide special education to these eligible students but not every kid who's struggling is going to qualify for special ed. To get services, their performance has to be adversely affected by a disability that's in one of these 13 categories. So I'll just run through these really quickly. A specific learn learning disability, this is the most common category where kids qualify under IDEA. About 34% of students for in special education qualify into this category. Um, it's, it's an umbrella term for a wide range of learning challenges. Um, IDEA says that these challenges must affect the child's ability to read, write, listen, speak, reason, or do math. Next you have OHI or other health impairment. Um, this is a term that is defined as a a condition that limits a child's strength, energy, or alertness. The most common by far um, impairment that you would see under OHI is ADHD. So um, ADHD almost always falls under OHI. And remember though, that disability has to have an adverse effect on the child's educational performance. So if you conduct an evaluation indicating a child has ADHD, but there's not necessarily an adverse impact on educational performance, that student still might not qualify for special education services. Then you've got your autism spectrum disorder, Emotional disturbance, which includes a variety of mental health issues, anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, um, 
you have a speech language impairment. So that would, you know, some common examples might be articulation or stuttering. It can also be language problems um, like ex expressive and receptive language that you may be evaluating. Then we've got visual impairment. That's essentially partial, sighted, or blind. Deafness, a hearing impairment. Deaf blindness, which is both hearing and vision loss. Orthopedic impairment, which is a physical impairment. A lot of times you'll see cere cerebral palsy. An intellectual disability. And of course, for a child to qualify here, you've got to have a cognitive assessment like the WISC or the KBC, and then an adaptive assessment. You got traumatic brain injury, and then very the 13th thing on this list is multiple disabilities. So that just means that they have multiple issues that create um, an educational need that's really specialized to that student and doesn't necessarily fit neatly into any other category. So as you're conducting your evaluations, think about these 13 areas of eligibility and the children that you're working with and make sure that you demonstrate educational need um, as you're conducting that evaluation. Have anything to add? Yeah. Well, you know, emotional disturbance is one of those areas where um, you know, that captures a pretty broad swath of mental health problems that folks, that kids would have, um, whether they be externalizing or internalizing, um, and really the full range. And so um, it, it, it can capture a lot of, of those areas. Other health impaired, as you mentioned, typically tends to be uh, the category where ADHD kids, ADD kids uh, come into play, but it could be other things too. It could be, um, you know, um, uh, they may have some gastrointestinal issues or, you know, something along those lines that may impair their, uh, they may need to leave class for example, and make accommodations for that. So it, it's pretty broad. Um, that uh, the, so to one, of the, one of the kind of, if you are trying to evaluate and place somebody along one of these categories and for whatever reason, the district decides not to take that evaluation and, um, and they don't agree with it, that, um, you know, sometimes what they will do is, is they will not get them involved in a formal IEP, but if they have a diagnosis that you have given them, um, while well, they may not accept them into the IEP, that diagnosis still counts uh, under a 504 plan, which we'll get to in a minute. So you can still make some accommodations, but there are some limitations that come to the district by doing that route versus uh, the IEP route. Yep, exactly. <laughs> so if a child isn't found to be eligible for special education services under IDEA with an IEP, then they may be protected under what's called a 504 plan. Um, this is it's usually seen as a good option when a child is able to function within that regular education environment with accommodations. It's a little less restrictive than an IEP. Um, one of the primary differences is that with a 504, students don't get an IEP. Um, they also, again, like, like um, Dr. Moran was saying, it's not one of those 13 areas that we'd be looking at. They could have any disability that interferes with their ability to learn in general education. Um, the Section 504, it's part of the uh, Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and it's really all about discrimination on the basis of disability. It ensures that a student with a disability has access to accommodations that improve academic functioning. Um, an IEP is going to be better when a student has a disability that's that's adversing, adversely impact, impacting their education, and it's going to offer increased protection in, in different situations. So by definition, they have to have a disability that limits one or more major life activities. Um, in my experience in schools, some examples of a 504 plan are maybe a, a child who has a type 1 diabetes and they need to go to the nurse to get insulin, or they have a physical impairment and they need to leave class early to navigate the hallways, or ADHD does fall under Section 504 sometimes. Mm -hmm. So just a few, um, one of the, the, I think, important differences between being on an IEP, which really, you know, what it means, individual education plan, is that the academic institution gets more flexibility in, in really changing the content uh, of the course material, even, of a child on an IEP. They may even change some of the requirements that are required to get a diploma. So they'll have like some states and districts will have what they call modified diplomas, which are 
uh, because the, the children are uh, who have the IP are not generating kind of academic product at the same pace as somebody else uh, who doesn't have that. And so they get accommodations uh, regarding some of those thresholds and whatnot. So it's much more, I think, of a pervasive intervention uh, options come with IEPs. The other thing is, is that they get paid for kids on IEPs, whereas a school district may make accommodations and modifications that look very similar to a child who has an IEP for the same diagnosis for, let's say, ADD or whatever, uh, but they don't get paid for a 504 plan. So it's a, it, some, you know, many schools really try to meet the 504 plan needs because they don't want to over-identify kids in special ed, even though they're doing the exact same thing. Some of them don't want to over 504 because they want the kids to be in the special ed because they need some of the compensation required. So it's a bit of a balancing act. And knowing your district's uh, stance on this is really important. Okay. Yeah, those are really good points. Mm -hmm. So accommodations and modifications. What we're really talking about here is the, the recommendations that you provide in your reports. So these terms might sound relatively synonymous, but they, they have pretty different meanings when it comes to special education. So an accommodation changes how a student learns the material, whereas a modification, it's a bit more of a substantial change. It changes what the student is taught or else expected to learn. So I have a couple examples here. So an example of an accommodation would be, okay, the child's going to learn the same material as their peers, but they're going to have the help of an audio textbook, or they're going to get extended time on the same test that everyone else is taking. A modification would be to actually reduce a reading assignment or assign different homework than the rest of the class is actually getting. So when, you know, when working with schools, a tip that I would offer is to really provide realistic recommendations. Staff are gonna be a lot more likely to listen and, and take your recommendations more seriously if they can actually implement your suggestions. So if a child has a hard time with basic reading skills and decoding, I wouldn't advise recommending a really specific curriculum. Instead, suggest something like a step-by-step -step approach to word reading or um, you know, a multi-sensory approach to, to word reading. And I, it's not generally advised to say in your recommendations that the child needs special education services. What you could say is that the child would benefit from additional support in reading or articulation, and then make sure you back up the educational need in your report. Because they don't necessarily have to listen if you say, okay, I need, this child needs to have special education services. Um, and then the last thing I want to say before passing this off to Dr. Moran is that you can really gain a lot of insight by working with the school. So when you're conducting an evaluation, of course, you're going to have consent. Um, go in and observe the classes at the school. Go into and look at the sh structured and an unstructured setting within the classroom. Um, you know, go look at a math class if they're struggling in math and then watch the child in PE. Um, interview some teachers, interview the school psychologist or school social worker. Send ratings. You know, you can email those very easily through Q Global, and even when it's appropriate, attend IEP meetings to review your results. So, yeah, and this is kind of a following up to one of the questions that's floating around: is that uh, you know, if we do an evaluation in school and they reject it, uh, what responsibility of does the school have for the parents to the parents in those cases? And and I kind of see this as a hierarchical. Uh, approach so let's say if they don't get qualified for an IEP but there is a diagnosis in place then you kind of ratchet it to, you do a step down to the 504 okay uh, and to try to make accommodations and modifications with that you know and, and as far as being available when I have done uh, psychoed evaluations I mean not when I was at the schools but as a contract contractor um, I always uh, uh, made myself available to at least be on a conference call if I could, um, or part of it for discussion and interpretation of whatever results came out of the assessment process. It's nice if you can get on site. It's nice if you can get to know the people in schools, particularly if you're building a kind of a regular uh, referral base uh, from that institution to you um, so that you get to know their flow and some of the teachers and so on. That's always very helpful. Not required, but it's good, I think. All right. So let's um, bounce over to, uh, I think, some of the systems 
at play regarding how how education works and what you're maybe not what you're up against, but what, how you're operating. So there's an important concept. Um, it's called seat time. And if you've uh, you know in, if you've been in the education world, you know exactly what this is. Uh, this is basically how the states allocate money to the school districts on um, literally a day by day by hour by hour by hour basis. So if you have a student who's at school for five hours during the day, then there is a financial um, metric that you, that school district gets paid so much money for that kid in classroom for those five hours. So this becomes an issue if you have a kid who get uh, expelled or suspended and whatnot, so that uh, the, the budgetary metric gets shifted around. So as you can imagine with COVID happening, uh, there is, this has created a bit of a challenge for districts because seat time, you know, when they're in your classroom, it's easy to, you know, you take your roll call, you know what's going on, send it to the office and that gets built into the budget system. But with COVID-19, many of the activities are now being done remotely. And so uh, school districts have had to find some uh, ways around uh, the traditional model and demonstrating that kids are actually in class through uh, the, the remote learning uh, apparatuses that they put in place. But one of the fallouts of this is that many districts have actually had students withdraw from the district proper to do online um, schooling through some other third party uh, avenue. And this has led to a real reduction in some of the, uh, the revenues that uh, districts would have in, in both general education and special education. And those are two different streams of, of funding. So I'll talk about those. Um, general ed is what most of the funding goes to, about uh, 90, 85 to 90% of the funding for most districts, uh, when you look at the aggregate across the country, goes into general education. Uh, and then uh, when a student has an IEP, that opens up a gate to additional funds uh, per student uh, to help support their um, their modifications to their education, having special classrooms, special interventions, and so on. Uh, special, um, perhaps uh, if they have some uh, disabilities that the school may have to provide some hardware. For example, mobility hardware for them while they're there or computer hardware uh, for them that uh, other students wouldn't have. And so those costs can become, become quite, quite, quite a bit. And, um, and so typically, uh, if a school might get, uh, I don't know, five, six thousand dollars per, per pupil, once they get on an IEP, that could literally double, in some cases, even, even triple, uh, depending on the, the districts and where they are. So, so knowing that this is a potential for well, heck, now if I get students on IEPs, the district gets more money. The um, the um, the uh, the state wants the, the the federal government really kind of watches how high your roles are on IEPs or versus how low they are. And there's a general target that uh, they anticipate uh, a school district should. Ha have, I think, anywhere from like 10 and a half to 12 and a half percent of their students would be uh, in special ed. And that if you go above that range by a certain uh, fr um, uh, fraction, that you have to justify why you are overrepresented or underrepresented in your IEP counts for your district. So if you're underrepresented, are you not capturing students who actually need assistance uh, and not doing your, you know, your, uh, the child find. Um, if you're overrepresented, then are you, um, are you inappropriately uh, you know, funneling kids into that for revenue, which, you know, I don't think that really happens um, much, if at all. Or are you dealing with some, maybe some other more um, kind of uh, issues that may be uh, region or uh, culture specific. For example, we have overrepresentation of minorities often in special ed, particularly for behavioral disturbance. And so that gets looked at very closely. We may have um, an underrepresentation of, um, for example, students who are identified as gifted, which is also a special, ed we haven't really mentioned that, but it's also a special education uh, domain. So this is, uh, uh, so it's, it's in this, it's in the, the, the local educational authority's best interest to identify their uh, special ed um, uh, roles, as it were, within that window, so they don't get too much scrutiny from the state and the government and the federal government to justify why they have more or less students in that area. Uh, the other thing that has happened with uh, some of the changes in the regulations is that 
is they moved away from uh, one of them, the models I'll get to in a second, but where they allowed um, a certain amount of special ed dollars to be spent in general ed to try to identify students who may be at risk of having a learning disability, but maybe aren't warranted to have the full evaluation yet so that they can use some of those resources to do intervention, early intervention to determine if it's really just uh, teaching issues that are going on or not, you know, maybe not best practices are being implemented in the classroom and then that is impacting the student's learning versus the presence of some internal experience that's causing a learning disability or other learning uh, struggles. Um, so, so the, you know, there's, there is always uh, kind of this tension between gen ed, special ed regarding how uh, re resources are allocated and spent. Then there are other uh, large grants, uh, Title I grant, which is uh, the early, I believe it's the early reading uh, grant. So, so for uh, students and in some cases, schools and even indeed some districts where reading really seems to be lagging is that the federal government provides early reading grants to help supplement um, the interventions that the students would get outside of this whole special education uh, world. Uh, because if you get reading mastery, that sets the stage for all other learning um, down the line that you're gonna get in public education. Another funding source, oh, so excuse me, so, so some of those grants, you know, uh, they can be, uh, for, for, for example, lower income communities, many of them um, require some of these title, uh, these title grants in order to uh, provide some adequate supports for their students. And then there's Medicaid. So uh, many few folks aren't aware, but that uh, schools, if they have the qualified professionals working with either within the school or um, with qualified health clinics, uh, can actually bill for those conditions where there's a formal medical or DSM diagnosis. So, for example, speech and language uh, intervention specialists uh, do this all the time, where they'll uh, identify speech uh, speech disability speech and language disability, and then they'll work with the child maybe once or twice a week for a series of months, working on helping them improve their articulation or reduce a lisp or stutter or something along those lines. And then they can actually bill Medicaid for compensation for that. And, um, and but, so this applies really to any medical intervention that the school is in a position to um, provide. And with uh, mental health being integrated more and more into school districts, uh, we're seeing more of this uh, happening. Um, and then there's this, um, they also get funding from what we call these umbrella educational agencies. Uh, out West, we call these uh, educational service districts. I think BOCES are out of New York. Um, anyways, there, there's a whole bunch of different acronyms which describe them. But these tend to be uh, designed to help more uh, heavily impacted districts uh, for like specialty high high cost, uh, uh, low incidence disorders, such as, for example, autism. So if you have a cluster of autism in the school district that, that are more severe, autistic kids that are more severe, those become very expensive uh, interventions and support from the district. And so what happens is, is these uh, umbrella education agencies will have specialized programs where they'll supplement the school districts to provide some of those uh, educational interventions uh, as a good example. And then you know, how are you going to get paid, though, as a, as a practitioner? So if you're providing, if you're working as a consultant, most likely you're not going to have much access to any of these uh, resources. These are going to be resources that go into the schools, into the LEAs and, and, and the, the SEAs, which is the state educational authorities, who then may funnel that through or contract that through with you. So uh, you know, if you're going to be doing independent work, then you know whether or not insurance covers that is going to be based on the plans that they have, uh, as well as fee for service. Um, sometimes the the um, and this has been my personal experience is working with some of these umbrella agencies is they like to contract with folks that are independent of the district so that they can offer a level of objectivity um, and protection for themselves, uh, as well as um, making really a strong argument that they're. You know, their motivation is pure in what they're trying to do to support the child, and then they're not coming in a biased way by providing an examiner, if that's an issue. Um, you know, I can think of one example for a uh, case example is there was a young man that I had evaluated, um, I was asked to evaluate, who had basically threatened to blow up the principal. He got in an argument with the principal, he said, I'm going to blow up his truck, okay? So when they went and looked at his record, uh, they saw that he had been exhibiting uh, all kinds of behavioral problems for many years, and they just never really 
referred for evaluations and consideration for um, being emotionally disturbed. Um, and he had been fighting and had been struggling in school and just a whole litany of problems. And they didn't deal with it. And so what happened was that after the threat to blow the principal's truck up, the district was concerned about their vulnerability, about not making the right decision earlier on. And so bringing in the outside consultant, um, they were able to then move forward with getting this child evaluated and then a decision made to put them into special ed um, and offered a level of protection for themselves as well by doing that. So there's a real place for psychologists to be able to provide that, I think, um, in these kinds of scenarios. So, so we talk already a bit about um, the el eligibility criteria, but there are models for determining eligibility. I think that's very important for s clinical psychs to know about um, how the educational world operates. Okay, so, so, so for example, how will you define a specific learning disability? This is the largest category of eligibility in schools. I believe upwards of eighty-five percent of kids who have an IEP have what is called a specific learning disability in reading, writing, and math, okay? So it's important that you know locally what your state's regulations are. Now, there are a number of models out there. I'll, I'll hit real quickly, but uh, you wanna become familiar with these. The first and the oldest was what we described as the discrepancy model, which looked at the predicted difference between someone's ability, which is an IQ test, and their achievement. Okay, and so the way that these work collect, collect, um, together and, uh, and IQ tests are highly predictive of educational success is that the IQ score basically gives you um, a, a probability for how successful you should be in your achievement. And then when you give them the achievement test, if their achievement scores are actually below where that IQ test predicts they should be, then they would have a discrepancy and typical discrepancy difference would be one and a half standard deviations. And then they would be determined eligible for special education. And then they would get all the assistance that they needed from that. Okay. Well, the, the issue that this model brought up was that if you happen to have an IQ score that was kind of just moderate and your achievement score was com com comparable to that IQ score, but the child was still struggling and failing in school, but their achievement testing that uh, we, that was given says there's not a discrepancy, then the child doesn't get the intervention, they don't get identified, they continue in maybe two or three more grades while their achievement continues to tank and because um, the IQ score is very stable. And so after three years, now their achievement has fallen below that one and a half standard deviations and they have a statistical discrepancy and a decision is made. So the argument about this model was that it was called the wait to fail model. When kids who you knew had a learning disability, but the, the, the regulations were becoming an imp impediment to actually getting them the support that they needed. So out of this grew um, um, a response to that, which was called response to intervention, where why wait for them to fail? Why don't we try to identify uh, early on what their uh, educational needs are through providing uh, best practice interventions in discrete windows of time and then to see how they responded to those modifications to teaching by doing best practices. And then if the, if the problem remained, then you would ratchet it up to giving them some more support. And if they don't respond to more support, then you refer for IEP evaluation because there's some um, belief that that's there. Now, some states have actually said, if you do RTI and, um, and you kind of ratchet it up, that by the time you get to the point they're not showing any progress, that's good enough to identify for special ed. OK, um, other states have said, well, you really need to use that as more of a prevention and early identification. And then once you think the concerns are there, then you do the evaluation using the IQ test and the achievement test and behavior measures and look for what we call so either for the discrepancy decision point or use what we call assessing for patterns and strengths and weaknesses. Now, I'm not going to go too far on this, but there's um, been this has been a growing model that's been integrated into states who do both RTI and uh, the discrepancy model. But it, what PSW does is it looks at known cognitive links to achievement deficits. And if you see patterns that are consistent with that, such as processing speed or working memory being low on the IQ test, and you see comparable low scores on uh, reading or math, that 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 pattern is is congruent and um, and supports the presence of a learning disability. 
So some states have actually allowed all three. So, for example, California, uh, their regulations say do RTI, and then if it's uh, continuing to struggle, students struggling, follow up with assessment of patterns of strengths and weaknesses to uh, determine your decision and in inclusion in special ed. And they also left the discrepancy model on there as well. So that you can do all three, but most have kind of migrated to the RTI and the PSW hybrids. Um, it's more nuanced and it's more uh, specific to how a child processes information. And then just uh, the, you should be also be aware that um, dyslexia, dyscalculia, and dysgraphia are all assessed through these models as well. Uh, but with the more recent regulations uh, from the federal government up, being updated, they've actually uh, written in uh, these three alert subgroups of learning disabilities um, uh, and language and have uh, basically required us to be, as, as evaluators, to be more nuanced and targeted in uh, articulating the presence of these uh, three areas of learning disability. Okay. So as we mentioned, uh, all these, there's a, uh, there's a series of categories that you can uh, use to get qualified for special ed. And some of those you can get paid for by doing services with them, as I mentioned earlier, either through Medicaid um, or, as a, or as a practitioner. Uh, and uh, I, there's a term here, um, you know, I mentioned health personnel, so nurses can work with, with students who have uh, medical diagnoses, uh, psychologists can, uh, speech and language therapists can, social workers can, uh, and some districts have what they call FQHCs, which are these federally qualifying health clinics. You see these a lot in rural communities, um, but many of them are integrated into school districts as well, where it's an, it's an independent uh, health clinic that's integrated into the school districts. And so for many kids who have IEPs, they may also be able to get additional uh, therapeutic or, or treatment support um, in these FQHCs, and then the district can get compensated for those interventions. What you will see here, though, is that specific learning disabilities is not typically one of those that you get uh, treatment for, per se, uh, independent of the um, academic environment. Uh, so those typically don't get billed for and compensated for. But all these other conditions that are, are categorical uh, to uh, being on an IEP uh, do have mechanisms for compensation. And uh, being aware of that and perhaps you know developing a consultative uh, relationship with a district where you come in and provide targeted treatment for those uh, kids who, who may require it um, are, are practice opportunities for psychologists. And then, um, so then what do you want to choose? <laughs> Test selections and scores are also important to know when you're working with, um, with schools. First of all, you want to use up-to-date measures. Um, uh, you, you know, every publisher is updating the norms based on you know, the, the changes in census and demographics and to try to stay uh, kind of abreast of the, the changing times um, as regularly as we can. So so you want to do that, okay? And so, you know, if you are going to be giving an achievement test, you don't want to be giving a version that's 15 years old when there's a, a new one out because that can later get challenged and thrown out. But then also low, know your legal considerations and restrictions. Okay, and these vary by state. So there are due process processes um, that are built in so that people can be uh, students and can be um, uh, ensured that they're being covered. Okay, uh, so there are some uh, local restrictions. So for example, uh, Larry P was a ruling out of California that uh, back in the 70s that you can't use IQ tests on African-Americans or, or for that fact, uh, any test that measures cognitive abilities. Um, on African Americans, uh, uh, because at the time the tests were legitimately um, um, biased, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and they were uh, detrimental to some some of those communities. So, uh, being aware of those, uh, not only the regulations for your state for making the determination for an IEP, but also knowing some of the restrictions. Now, the restriction for Larry P in California is only applied to schools. Private practitioners can use tests and um, um, uh, cognitive tests, for example, with African Americans, and in fact, uh, maybe do so uh, because the schools refuse to do it, and the parents will go out and, and get support from an external evaluator. And then those findings uh, can often be used to influence some of the decision processes that the schools uh, need, even though they didn't do it themselves. It depends on the district. 
Uh, and then there's this, uh, you need to test now have what we call uh, gross, uh, excuse me, um, gross scores. And you'll see those represented as GSVs. Uh, this was a requirement for the federal government, from the federal government, that when you do uh, achievement testing in particular, that you can um, you generate a score that allows you to track change over time relative to the aggregate of uh, normative uh, reference populations. And so they're always going to be generated, particularly if you're doing digital scoring. Um, many people don't really use them because they don't understand them, but they're there. <laughs> okay. But then commonly used tests in academics are going to be uh, cognitive, you're going to, uh, like the, uh, like, you know, Pearson, we published the Weschlers, the achievement tests, like the Wyatts and the KTAs, uh, major behavior tests that are out there, such as the Basques or the Achenbachs or the Connors. Um, uh, also developmental tests, such as the Vineland, uh, or excuse me, uh, such as the Bailey or the Mullins. And then adaptive tests, such as the Vineland or the Abbas, are, are frequently used as well. And there's a whole a range of speech tests, depending on, particular needs, whether it's uh, receptive language, expressive, articulation, so on. And then we're seeing more and more of the executive functioning and neuropsych tests that are being used, particularly with districts that are doing patterns of strengths and weaknesses analysis, because it gives you more direct information about memory processing, encoding and retrieval, and some of these effects, and, and, and the executive functioning that has a direct impact on learning behavior. And then um, we're also seeing more personality assessments being brought into psychoeducational evaluations, um, particularly for those kids that where, you, where you're trying to determine emotional disturbance as a qualifying criteria uh, for getting special education uh, support. Uh, and these will, you know, personality assessments, uh, they, they, I, I like to describe them as giving you a little bit more information about what's going on inside the black box of the child's uh, psychological experience in a way that uh, behavioral rating scales uh, don't do to quite the degree, un unless they're filling out the self-report on the behavior rating scale. But even then, um, I think sometimes these personality inventories, uh, particularly for the more disturbed uh, students, uh, psychologically disturbed, emotionally disturbed students, can be quite informative. And then, um, so, so the nice thing about using standardized tests is that, you know, schools are very reliant on school psychologists and they know the speak of uh, stats and they know uh, normative sampling, they know raw scores versus scaled scores and whatnot. And so it provides a common language for you and the school psychologist to uh, discuss kind of the basis of your decisions and conclusions um, uh, using standardized information. And then, oh, uh, we have a five minute warning. If we can extend this a little bit, that'd be great. Okay, Sherry, thanks. And then um, this comes up a lot, you know, um, age equivalence versus grade equivalence. Uh, most states, to my knowledge, require age-based scores um, when you do your normative reflections of, of where the student falls uh, versus grade-based. Uh, and that's because the grades are really more highly influenced by regional variances, such as quality of the educational experience and teaching um, uh, will impact maybe a student's reading in one district, a reading acquisition in one district versus another district, which may be uh, have less resources and maybe has more social challenges and poverty and whatnot. So, um, so by far, you're going to be using the age equivalent uh, reference. Um, parents like to know grade equivalent, but we caution that because it can be misrepresented too easily. Um, and then some um, unique circumstances and considerations uh, you want to be familiar with. Um, so, uh, Manifest de manifestation determinations is a term that's used in education to determine if a, if a behavior that happens at school, let's say a student gets into a fight or they steal something or they set something on fire, okay, is, is, is that a product of what we call social maladjustment or is that the product of, of like a reactive uh, emotional disturbance? So for our purposes, a social maladjustment is really speaking to those kids that are more kind of the, the budding antisocials, like the oppositional defiant, but that's really uh, based more on um, social norms of a cohort of, of other students or like-age students or be, uh, people of behavior uh, 
same similar behaviors that they're hanging around with. But absence the, that social influence, they're less like they're not likely to have engaged in that behavior. Whereas emotional disturbance is really speaking to the, the child has some internal disturbances that are driving their their behavior and their actions. And so you'll often see with this with kids who have very difficult times modulating their anger um, and then they get they get taunted and then they react poorly and they externalize their anger and then they have to potentially get uh, expelled and so before that happens if they're on an IEP they are required to do this manifestation determination and the districts will engage in what's called a, a, a functional behavior analysis or assessment which looks at precedence uh, that uh, excuse me not precedence but looks at um, uh, what preceded the behavior, uh, what kind of reinforcements the behavior has at, at, as it occurred, what kind of reinforcements occurred, or what was the outcome from the behavior. Uh, and so you're really looking at the function of the behavior and helping determine the recommendation as to whether the behavior is um, a product of their disturbance versus social maladjustment. Unfortunately, sometimes you have kids that are both. And the problem with this is, is that you may have an emotionally disturbed qualifying condition for a child who also has some predatory behaviors, um, which are which would be captured in that social maladjustment world. Um, and so making the differentiation between the two is, is um, difficult sometimes. But if they have both, the school district still has to address the issues. Uh, so I think it's helpful for us as psychologists to, to, to then be informed to some degree about criminogenic thinking, criminogenic behaviors, criminogenic attitudes. Um, and this is particularly relevant if you're going to be asked to do any kinds of violent risk assessments uh, for the school districts, where you're going to use personality measures, behavior, cognitive uh, measures, and so on, but also a very detailed history, not only of the family, but of the child's behavior uh, in their community. Uh, they had... Uh, crossovers with law enforcement, and so on. Um, I put the hair psychopathy uh, checklist youth version here because it speaks to some of the criminogenic uh, uh, behaviors and thoughts of, uh, of those who um, engage in criminal behavior. And while most, most school psychologists are not familiar with this kind of thinking, whenever I was doing a uh, manifestation determination hearing um, to determine ED versus a social maladjustment, I would uh, regularly uh, review this um, to, to kind of see how much of the criminogenic patterns are emerging in the, these youth. So then, um, I know we're going over a little bit, but um, so it's just final thoughts um, about uh, making recommendations from your findings is that Recommendations in a clinical setting versus an education setting are different. What education psychologists do not do, and you, that you will, well, well, what we do as clinical psychologists that does not get well metabolized in the schools is creating huge, long reports, 27-page reports. They don't need that. Briefer is better, particularly if you can target the specific learning impacts of, of what you are observing through your testing, okay? You can make recommendations uh, that please do, but make them that are realistically going to be deliverable in the school and try not to be too, too vague in your recommendations if you can help it. OK, um, then who will be responsible for implementing these recommendations is very important, um, uh, because if you make grand recommendations that nobody can implement, then it's going to go nowhere. So kind of knowing the reality of the situation. Uh, the tune your recommendations to uh, what they need, okay? And then does this require an outside referral? Sometimes that's the case, particularly if kids uh, uh, may need to have uh, medication uh, referrals. Most districts are not gonna provide that. They will work with somebody externally um, or have you do that externally. And then, um, so as a part of your recommendations, uh, you may find, you may believe that the child, and this is particularly with uh, emotionally disturbed kids, that they, you might really think they need residential care. And now I will tell you, a school district does not want to hear that because that means if it's a part of their file, that means if it comes to it, they may, they, they may then be required to pay for that. Okay. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but I'm just saying be aware that the recommendations that you make may have a lot of power down the line regarding fiscal impact on the school districts. One of my very first evaluations I did as a school psychologist coming out of the clinical world, and I'd worked with youth programs, gang programs, and whatnot, as I saw this kid, and I thought, this is this kid's heading towards residential care because he's really dysregulated and not doing well. And I put that in there, and they let me keep it in, but they worried them. All right. So, and then is, if there's going to be psychotherapy in the school, is it doable? 
there are programs that are beginning to do DBT, for example, in schools with uh, uh, middle schoolers and high schoolers uh, with uh, some success. So, you know, know, know those interventions that are uh, workable in the schools. And then, um, then how specific do you get? Uh, you know, I think that uh, if you can give some targeted pointers about how to adjust environments as appropriate for learning, uh, if you're familiar with learning and pedagogy, uh, building some of that into your recommendations is helpful and adds to your credibility also as, a psych as an evaluating psychologist. So here are some resources uh, for you to just become familiar with. Uh, NASP is the National Association of School Psychologists. There's over 100,000 of them members. U.S. Department of Ed, as well as uh, you want to be familiar with the State Department of Ed regulations, as I mentioned earlier. APA has a, has a number of divisions that are uh, dedicated to this, the educational psychology, school psychology, and then and the intellectual and developmental disability autism spectrum disorder um, division as well. And then National Center for Educational Statistics is a nice clearinghouse for uh, data for you. So we went over a little bit. Um, we can hang around for Q&A uh, if uh, we want to do that. Do we still have uh, folks here? It looks like we do. Do you want to dive into some questions? Folks here, there's, there's lots of great questions that I've been trying to answer. And, and another thing that I would ask is, um, you know, there's a lot of interesting topics coming up in these questions. When you uh, leave comments at the end of the session, if you want to note something that would be useful for you to learn about in the future, that gives us um, a good idea of some, some content that would be valuable for, for everyone in attendance. Um, somebody wanted to, uh, I'm, I'm just kind of scrolling through some of the questions and so I'll just pull them out as I come up. So, um, so someone asked, can you talk about the impact of environmental factors on eligibility for SPED services and, and or trauma impacts? So the first one, I think that um, environmental factors are actually critical. Um, and indeed, it, it could lead to somebody being qualified or disqualified, depending on what you find. So let me give you an example. There was a, um, a student I evaluated. I think she was probably 12, 13 years old, who half of her academic life, she was not in school because she was a drug mule for her family and was running meth back and forth places and just, you know, the whole situation was bad, okay? So she stopped going to school, I think, after the uh, second grade. And, uh, and now she was placed out of home and they're bringing her in for an evaluation to determine if she has a learning disability. So one of the things that an evaluator has to determine is, is, the, is the lack of academic uh, development, the result of having a disability or is it the result of not being exposed to the educational environment sufficiently well to have learned what they needed to learn, okay? So in this case, it was very difficult to make an argument that the student had a specific learning disability, um, and that's what they were looking for, because of she has such significant environmental impacts um, uh, on, um, on her learning. And so the, the IEP team decided that an eligibility for a specific learning disability was not met, even though her ability and achievement scores were um, discrepant. Uh, so that is a factor that is considered. Now, that doesn't mean they don't get that she didn't get help through another eligibility, but um, that is something that you want to be prepared to argument, argue for or against, depending on what the data tells you and the history tells you. Okay. Um, I hope that was helpful. You want to take one, Lindsay? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm answering some questions here, but um, okay, yeah. I mean, since we're over um, time, I think we should probably go ahead and wrap up. Okay, we can, I guess. Yeah, sure. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us today, and um, we hope this was informative and. Um, uh, we will uh, respond. We will get the uh, the questions uh, sent to us, and we'll try to respond to them as we can. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone.